Chattery interview parts across your back to where it almost all began, that crossover between GP and the Supercross race and Jeremy McGrath. How pivotal was that night for you in terms of maybe believing in yourself to, that you could really do it on the American stage? Uh, yeah, truthfully I don't know that it, that particular night was good or bad for me. Um, I think that that night probably defines how I thought. You know, like I, my biggest idol ever and he left the door open and I threw it in there and we made contact and both crashed. Um, but I went on to beat him for the rest of the weekend. So, uh, and and also for the most part of you know the rest of his career in the U.S. So, um, I was a young kid with a full head of steam that wanted to go and win races and do the best I could. And so I, I don't know that that weekend you know is good or bad. Um, but I think it was consistent with the rest of it. You know, so just uh, yeah, I'm excited to be back. I haven't been you know what, almost a year. Yeah. A year and a half yeah without taking supercross gate drops um, so yeah I'm sure that like riding by myself I feel I feel okay riding um, but the real test will be when when I line up elbow to elbow and um, and you only get that that intent like there's a race intensity mm -hmm. and I think the race intensity is is probably what I'll lack because um, that just comes from racing so uh, but I think outside of that it should be a fun weekend you know? have you missed race is that part of the reason you're doing this, or have you been relatively content watching your your kids start? Yeah, I I would honestly say that I've been content. Like I haven't, I really haven't missed racing um, because I've been so busy doing other stuff. Yeah. I also got to do some, uh, like I've been doing some amateur racing um, at some local area stuff. Um, so like my kind of like the. How would you see it? Like that need or the want to race, ride or whatever. Like I feel like I've been watering that in other ways. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I can honestly say it at a, at a professional level, I haven't missed racing. Um, but this was like a timing thing. I always believe in, you know, things happen for a reason. Opportunities come about because of, you know, where you're at in life. And, and for me, I was just riding. I was, I was kind of wanting to get back into shape a little bit. So it was just perfect timing to come and, and, and yeah, race. So. And watching your kids, how does that compare nerve-wise to whenever you way, were racing? Way more nerve-wracking. Really? Than, yeah. <laughs> I can honestly say that for the 265 or whatever it was starts that I did, I don't know that I was ever as nervous as watching my children race. Like, it's a real, especially when, uh, like, my 85, you know, my 11-year-old's on an 85, and he's starting to, you know, starting to push those boundaries and wanting to go faster, do the bigger jumps. And that, that, that's, that gets me a little bit scared, you know? But it also excites me, so hopefully he figures that out quickly where I can be a little bit more at ease. Um, but yeah, it's, I really enjoy trying to help and, you know, watch them do their thing. And do you feel now you even understand what your dad went through watching you make the steps each, each year? Definitely different perspectives of my childhood comes up while going back to the races as a, you know, with your own children. Um, my dad, like if I was to describe my dad, I would call him you know, my dad was always super committed to me, um, but always very high, strong, stressed, and and I never understood why. Um, and I think I have a different understanding, a different perspective of why that. You know, just because the travel to the races, the anxiety of your kid, you know, riding at such a high level and pushing the limits of all those things. So yeah, I. I, I understand that side of my parents a lot more. Yeah. I just want to give you on to Tony Caroli. What he's done this year, winning again at the GP at 36 years old, and he even got the Nations. Nine world titles. I know you know him, you're fairly friendly with yeah. him. What are your thoughts on his career and how long he's been able to go? You know you know about riding in your mid 30s as well? Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously Tony and I are great friends, and for probably the past 10 years we've been quite close to being able to go back and communicate whether it be I go and stay and hang out in Italy or you know whenever they're in the US so uh, but yeah amazing career um, it's tough when you when you get older 
Like everyone talks about an age that at a certain point it's a drop off. I, I don't know that it's a drop off, but it's it's the feeling and the pressure. Like you think you have pressure as a as a young kid trying to make it. Yeah. I think the pressure as an established great and there's few of those, right? Yeah. And I would put Tony in the greats. Yeah. Uh, to sustain being great, to sustain trying to win more titles, there's far more pressure. And I see, I felt it. Okay. I seen it in Tony and I seen it in Valentino. Yeah. Uh, trying to succeed at that level of being older, I think that that wears on you. Okay. And your time, it's like your every every race is the last race. Yeah. And, it, and it's that it's that feeling that that the time's getting away from you. And so sometimes I, th- I think you put so much effort into trying to win because you feel the t- ticking, you yeah, know, the, yeah, yeah. the clock ticking. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's kind of like it's unfair <laughs> to feel like you're getting older and then like that that clock ticking, you know. So I wish that, I wish the world was a little more quiet in, you know, telling that, hey, you're getting old. Because I don't think it's a matter of old, you know. I really don't. I, I think it's just a matter of. We've seen Tony this year already win a GP, you know. So can he win? Yes, you know. But it's that ability of sustaining it, knowing that it's going away, and that's what's hard, you know. We're seeing that a wee bit more. You've done it, Tony's done it, Tom Brady in NFL, Cristiano Ronaldo in yeah. football, and Messi, all mid thirties and still at a very high level. Tom yeah. Brady in his forties. Is there a reason for that in this generation? You think? Or? Tom Brady is. I feel like the exception, right? Like he, it seems like the higher the pressure, the bigger the game, the better he is. And but it's also not fair to compare Valentino, Tony, myself, because yeah. uh, you're you're an individual. Yeah. And when you have a team of people willing to take some of that burden, Tony. And Valentino are only as good as they are, right? Yeah. Where Tom Brady's badass, and he probably brings the team up. Yeah. But if those guys are not catching the ball, then it doesn't matter how good he is, right? Yeah. So I always think that it's team sports is a little different, and it's yeah. hard to compare, you know. But like Tom Brady is badass. Forty-two, I think he is. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Moving to your career, whenever you look back. For me, what you did in your first year in the World Championship to get second was probably almost as amazing as winning the Supercross title, although Gordon Crockett still isn't happy that you beat him to second place at the last round of the year. He said you cost him a lot of money. (laughs) What were your thoughts on that season? Has that helped prepare you for America? Gordon's still asking for beer money. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean... I would yeah, I would agree that my first year was as good as yeah winning's winning right <laughs> but I think that more for me it was I expected to do well and the re- the year started out pretty tough but I got better and better and I was you know constantly a podium guy I won uh, I won uh, Lyric one of the toughest TPs of the year um, so when I look at that year. From where I came from to where I finished, the level was like I learned so much. And from that point was really the start of going forward, going to the US and things like that. So it just it gave me the confidence that I could achieve my long term goal. So I would say that Europe has always been valued to me as one of my most important pivotable, you know, years in my career. Ellie and I, my wife, is was, we were, were really excited to spend the year here. I learned so much from Shane King, being one, Jan de Groot, um, you know, Pichon, Gordon, all those guys just, you know, I was a big sponge. I just yeah. kind of learned a lot and it, that that set me up for the rest of the, the career, you know. And your first year in the 350 class, it was in an American 3. Carmichael maybe had a bit of intimidation on everyone else, but you weren't intimidated at all. You went straight out. You probably should have won that year in 03. Yeah. Had you any doubt going into that season? Did you think it was, you were going to be that fast? Did I think I was going to be that fast? Yeah. Yes and no. Um, 
The young version of me, yes. I thought I could do it. Uh, but was the expectation to go win a title? No. I don't know that I truly believed. And probably why I lost is, is because of that. You know, I think that... I think it was round... It was like round three or four. You know, like I, I won the first race. I was second at the second one. Um, and then I really struggled. I think I was like... I had a bad start. And then I was I was young, and I, I, all I wanted to do was get to the front. And I got six. And when you look at the points difference, like that one race was the difference, you know? Yeah. So forever, you just like, you just, it was a learning, right? Would I change it? I wouldn't because it was just part of the process. But yeah, I believe that I could win. I believe that I could be as good as Ricky. Um, but did I think I could be a champion in 2003? I, I probably lacked that belief a little bit, you know? And did winning it fulfill all your childhood ambitions in terms of the feeling of euphoria the, the year you won it in 04 finally? Yeah, I mean, it was... It's just that accomplishment of, like, you set... For so many years of your life, you're like, I want to go to America, I want to go to America. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be Supercross champion. Like, and to achieve it only in year two was, was quite a big accomplishment, you know? And I was... That was like... You just... I hit the ground running, like... I think the, the team, the bike, like, it was a really good era. Yamaha was really strong on two strips, and I was, you know, I kind of inherited, like, Jeremy was kind of built Yamaha, and then I almost kind of inherited that and took it, you know, to another level. And so that was, that was really fun for me to think of my childhood looking up to Jeremy, and then to be able to kind of take it from that a little bit, you know, was, was really exciting. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was fun. And 05, I often wonder if you'd went to Suzuki instead of Ricky. I'd read you had that option, or I'm not sure how close it was. Would you ever look back? Is that a regret when you look back, or are you okay with that? I wouldn't say it was a... Uh, honestly, I never had the contract in hand. Okay. Um, so I rode the bike. Yeah. Uh, Ricky, I think in a lot of ways, I think they really wanted Ricky. Okay. And I think Ricky was probably wanting to go that direction, but I think he was also using it for, you know, leverage with Honda. Okay. Um, and I think I was part of the leverage. You know, I think I was almost the backup plan. Okay. Um, so I rode the bike and it was a good bike and probably riding the bike somewhat hurt me more than not because I knew how good the bike was and it was basically a Yamaha you know like the, the cylinder head was was basically a Yamaha the linkage was a Yamaha like the, the motorcycle rode like a Yamaha uh, the engine was a little bit better than ours you know because they were going into year two on yeah. on because it was uh, 2004 was the first year on unleaded yeah. so our bike in, in 04 was really good challenge but the engine was so-so um, where it was the opposite like I had rode the Suzuki realized that the engine was good when I stayed at Yamaha I, I, I made it aware I said guys I rode the Suzuki their engine is so much better than ours we need to work on it um, so I, our engine was really good in 05 but then our chassis was, was shit so um, yeah so you kind of and it was like for me it was I don't regret it because it wasn't ever really an option mm -hmm. uh, because Ricky took the deal and then yeah. obviously once he took that there yeah. was no budget to take both of us um, but the the thing that it, you always wonder like had that progression happen where where would your career have gone yeah. Um, but yeah kind of yeah it was exciting and we were we were kind of switched out a little bit you know like I had spent many years with having the better bike than Ricky. You know, I had better tires, better bike. And then in 05, he had the same tires and I really think that he had the better bike. Okay. And so it was a little bit a role reversal. So it was kind of like a, a bit of a wake up call of wow, like that bike kind of like how things change. Um, so yeah, a learning part of my life really. Those wins. Orlando was maybe the biggest supercross race ever and you won it and you just beat Ricky Which one? Orlando. Oh yeah. And you just beat Ricky up there too. Yeah. You didn't win the title but those wins must still be really special to you looking the, back. Yeah, because 
the, and those two you talk of were really special because uh, Orlando was it was really the first race of all three of us me, yeah. James and Ricky and the, um, hype like, the hype was, was you know till this day I've never I've never entered a race with so much just like you can feel the tension like individually I think we really wanted like that moment meant a lot to all of us and uh, so I think that to win that race was really special because no one can take that away from you you won the first battle Um, and then yeah of course Daytona you know Ricky was always so strong there and I kicked his ass that was such a good race like if there's any race throughout my whole career where it just, you just, when you know you hit the marks, you didn't leave anything out there, it was just, you know, boom, 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 lap after lap, actually really just turn for turn, just going for it, and that, that's how you want to race, right? Yeah. Like, that's the feeling you thrive for. Well, I don't know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Regarding the, not the MXGP World Championship was basically neck and neck with five, then three, then two at the last round. Yeah. How did you view that series and Hurling's delivering under pressure? Because you had a similar experience in 06 when it came down to the last round. Yeah, when you go into the last moto tied up, you know, it's it's nerve-wracking. Yeah. But I think, I mean, it's a little bit, you, you almost feel, I feel a little bit sad for Roman, you know? Yeah. So, you, well, you, the last two races are sand. Yeah, the last two. I mean, you're, at that point, you're really pushing. Like for him to come out, what was the last two? I think it was two races. And the first of the two races, he won the first moto. I think at that point, that's impressive. Yeah. You know, yeah, Jeffrey crashed or whatever. I think, I don't think it's a matter of you're lucky or not, but like I say that Jeffrey was very fortunate to have a lot of teammates yeah. throughout the last four races. Yeah. We've seen Tony pull over twice. Um, teammates are nice to have in that scenario because I think if you take that away, Jeffrey doesn't win, yeah. you know? Um, but you can always say what shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? What is your view on Jeffrey? Because on speed, he's probably one of the fastest ever, but he has all these, these injuries. He's very tough then on the other side to come through all that and win again. What's your assessment of him? <laughs> I I mean I agree he is obviously he's I I say he's badass. Yeah. But when you talk about the greatest people yeah. in the sport, I don't know that I put him in that group. Okay. Speed wise, yes. Yeah, but I mean the titles don't lie. Yeah. He has two. In my opinion he only has yeah. two titles. Lights are lights. Yeah. I don't count them. Yeah. Uh, and maybe he goes and wins the next five. In, yeah. I mean, he's getting old. How old is he now? 20, 28. Yeah. I mean, so he's not even old, right? <laughs> I thought he was older than that. Because he's been around for so long. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, when you look at dominance, in my opinion, dominance is controlling and understanding how to win world titles yeah. or, or championships. Yeah. And he didn't... He, did, he has not yet achieved that, in my opinion. But as far as a badass on a motorcycle and what he can do, I, one of the greatest at that. You, you see know? it more as like the James Stewart equivalent in the World Championship, that type of raw speed, but then obviously... Yeah, but... And, crashes. and I think that one thing... Uh, and it's hard to compare, right? Because... For me, I'm Team Tony. <laughs> so, and I'm not against Jeffrey, but if you put me out there and I was to take a lie detector, I'm Team Tony always. Um, and that's my era. Yeah. So I, I'm always going to gravitate towards that and, and our era. I think Jeffrey is a part of the new era. Yeah. Um, so it's hard. I don't know. It's always hard to comment on that. Without sounding disrespectful, because at no point, I'm not disrespecting yeah. what he's done, but I just there's a category, and I don't know that I put him there yet. You know. Well, yeah, I have a quick question. Obviously, you made a name for yourself in GPs, and you're an Aussie. Um, the last couple of years, the Aussies in the GP paddock, we've got Hunter and Jack coming through, um, Mitch Evans and Chad Beaton. Do you see any similarities with them guys and yourselves? And also looking at the future, I could see Australia possibly contending for a across the nation victory in the future. A victory. Uh... <laughs> 
if they all develop, as we expect. Donations is so difficult. Like, I've been on so many Donations teams where we should have been an easy second. Potentially went for the win. And it just... I think Donations comes down to so many different things. Luck is a big one. But luck comes from every individual understanding the big picture. Yeah. And every team I've been on, we always fall short in that. And I, 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 2011, we were on the podium. And France? Yeah, in yeah, France. I, I won the first moto. Um, but even that weekend, we should have been easily second, but uh, my teammate didn't even get to race the first moto because the bike broke. Yeah. So, like... I don't like saying luck, because luck in racing you kind of create it your own, yeah. but in so many ways I can, it seems the exception that Australia has really bad luck at donations. Um, but yeah, I mean there's so much talent, can all that talent come together on one day is yet to be seen. Um, I don't know. I know. I know the Lawrence brothers quite well because I've got to know them. But previous to the last kind of 12 to 18 months, I really didn't know much about them. Um, I met. Uh, I'm blanking. Who's uh, the Honda rider? Uh, Mitch. Sorry, Mitch. I'm, I got to meet Mitch last year here for the first time, uh, or two years ago at, uh, when I raced here. And uh, Mitch seems like a good kid. He seems like this year was really tough with a in, with a wrist injury. Um, I think Mitch seems like he has the ability to do quite well, but he needs to get on the right side of the preparation and bringing and working and bringing the luck to you. Um, why he's having injuries after injury, I don't know. Um, Jet seems like the, the obvious. He's the youngest. He's the one with the most success at this point. Um, but I don't really... I didn't know him as child, children, because I was always abroad, right? And, it's, and you're always... I was so busy that I never... You know, you don't you don't have that connection with what's happening at a, at a lower level. Uh, but I'm excited to see more Australians coming through. I have a question you might be able to ask. <laughs> The Australians are saying about New Zealand guys who are able to come from the GPs. The what? They adapt really quickly. Aussies and Kiwis. But Americans come to the GPs seem to struggle more. Obviously, Osborne or Mike Brown exception. Why is that when the level of the nationals are closer to the GPs than the Aussie series? What makes Australians at all be able to adapt to the World Championship or Europe better than generally an American? To me, it shouldn't really be like that. I think there's a few things. The, the U.S. way of racing is, is difficult. It's difficult to replicate that here. Okay. And, the, and I think Americans never have to... They never have to change much. You know, they grow up... They grow up on tracks that are similarly prepped throughout, you know, their amateur and their pro career. A lot of the teams and the infrastructure of amateur and pro is, is the same. Uh, Dunlop tires are from amateur to pro. So when you come here, the settings, the way you need to ride the bike, the way you need to ride the track is so different. And no one has done that. And not because they don't want to, but you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do you? Why would any American need to come to a Europe? I just, yeah. and that's a real question, not a disrespectful one. But why would you ever want to come here or need to come here? Because, because, because the goal growing up is to be a your own. The series is so big that you never have to go anywhere. So I think that when Villapoto is the exception, Villapoto came here as a good guy, but he came here because he was made to come. Yeah. I don't think he came on by choice. Yeah. And so I think the Ryan Villapoto that we that we know wasn't the same Villapoto here. I think the Villapoto that I know can can win here 100%. There's no you doubt in Tony? my mind. Huh? Have you told Tony? <laughs> I'll tell Tony. I will tell Tony. That. And I think that you if you deep if you ask Tony in the right scenarios I think Tony admits that Ryan is a part of the badass group, you know, I really, I do believe that. Um, 
so like yeah I mean no one no one at the top level has tried to come and make a career out of it here so it, it's a tough comparison it's so different as well it what is you need to win is quite it different, is isn't it? yeah and I think that and so getting back to your question of like Australians Australians have to be good here if you don't yeah. succeed here sure. you go home and you never get to go you never get to stay here yeah. or if your goal was like me and like Jet and Hunter if you don't succeed here you don't get to go to America yeah. so it's, a Europe is make or break yeah. so there's so much more emphasis yeah, you're, you're willing to change I think Australia is a good it's a blend of Europe and America okay. it's not one sided um, so I think that that's why Australians typically succeed at, you know maybe more here but then in the big scheme of things if you if you were to put it all out there who what Australians really succeeded out of here and won? Yeah. Jeff Lees, myself, Jeff Lees, can you use and him? Andrew. Yeah. He was good, yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And no one else has been successful. Just going back here. You know, like, like yeah. no one's won. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but no one's won races or challenged for titles. Yeah. 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 Being good and getting a good ride is one thing. Winning races, being on the podium, is and contending for a world championship is is another thing. And I think that uh, Andrew did that. Uh, I did it for a little. I don't. E I didn't even really technically contend for a title um, because Mikel was so much better. Yeah. Um, if you'd stayed, though, but, you would have. You know, had I have stayed and and tried to go for a world yeah. championship in twenty uh, two thousand and two. Then we would find out whether I was good enough or not, right? <laughs> but I don't know. That's Hunter was was good, but he didn't contend for a title. Yeah. Um, so again, not being disrespectful, but being going yeah. by the data and the, the yeah. numbers, they don't lie, you know. Yeah. So just uh, on the longevity of your career, I interviewed you after you won in, on the Kawasaki. I think was it San Diego or Anaheim that year, mm -hmm. fourteen maybe. Yeah. And then the next race, you got injured in the whoops. Oh, the I, in lap. San Diego, I got injured. Yeah. yeah. I was starting to think that's maybe the end of your career at that point, but you just kept coming back year after year and <laughs> you still had the speed for the majority of that. What kept you coming back? Because obviously that was another injury getting on in your career, but you were still able to come back. Did you just believe you could still do it or did you just really, really enjoy it? Yeah, and again, like, no regrets. Like, I never try to look back and look at, like, regret things. Mm -hmm. But, like, when you look back at the shoulda, woulda, coulda, 2012, I feel like... I'm worthy of a championship that year with me and Villapoto going back yeah, and forth and that's when I crashed and blew out my knee. Yeah. Um, and then 2014 was another one of those years where, you know, I was only two points shy of the, the, the championship lead. Villapoto and I had separated ourselves away. We were really strong. You know, we were beating up on Dungey and, and Stewart, you know, week after week. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you put yourself in that. Okay, it's between me and Ryan. We're gonna, yeah. one of us are gonna be champion, and I, like I, you put yourself in that category. Yeah. And I think that without the injury, can I go on and be champion? I think that there's yeah. a, a good chance. Um, so to come back from that injury, knowing that, yeah, time, at that point you acknowledge. I think at that point I'm 30, 31. Um, so at that point you acknowledge like time's ticking, yeah. right? Yeah. The clock's ticking away yeah. and, and those moments are, are, you don't necessarily say they're coming to an end, but you, you understand that time's going on. Um, so yeah, definitely it was kind of like just another kink in the armor a little okay. bit. I didn't know that yeah. it was like, oh, I'm done racing. Yeah. Um, and the reason my longevity, I just enjoyed racing okay. so much. Yeah. Like, I loved it. Like, all the way up until my last race, I loved it, and I I didn't see nothing else. Like, okay. everyone always says to me, like, oh, you know, like, if, like, I always look, I think of, like, uh, uh, Villapoto, Carmichael, um, and Dungey being so young, like, 27, yeah. 26, 27. Like, I always think, how at that age... Did they just walk away mm -hmm. because I I never could mm -hmm. but then maybe they felt what I felt where it was like a day something comes across you and you're like okay. I'm good yeah. and that never came across me right. until that last season yeah. going into the last season I, I was just like I'm like you start for me it was you start acknowledging what you did mm -hmm. and at that point I think it's over you're too much reflecting yeah, yeah. you're reflecting and you're, you're happy like you know like yeah. you have that good feeling of like wow like 
time flew by and like I really appreciate the battles and the things that I got to achieve and at that point you start you stop thinking you want to kill everyone you want to win everything and 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 I think that that at that point that was me acknowledging like that's it I'm done kind of thing and, and I haven't missed racing you know like really? I really no I haven't I'm excited to race this weekend um, but it's a very different scenario like I don't have you know I don't have that pressure of the qualifying and the the heat races and the practice times like yeah. you, you know you're in the main event it's about going and racing three main events and enjoying it you know like and that part I, I enjoy yeah. that like if I could like if I had a past champions exemption of like <laughs> you know like I could go to six, 17, yeah. 18 supercross races and just race main events like yeah. I would do that like okay. I actually would still do that but I just I don't enjoy the <laughs> the bullshit side yeah. of racing yeah. anymore yeah question on next year's Supercross series. I'm not sure if you're going to end up doing any of those races, but Eli Tomac switching to Yamaha. He's now teammates with Ferrandis, who's on the up. Ken Roxon not changing anything. And Cooper Webb, no Alden Becker, and obviously guys like Marvin reportedly flying at the test track. What's your take on the changes, and does Eli need to change teams, and Roxon does he need to change nothing, and Webb with the Alden <laughs> as well? I don't believe... <laughs> yeah, Kenny needs to change something. That's clear. Um, what that is is to be mm. determined, right? Yeah. Uh, we've all seen him be so worthy of a Supercross championship, but yet, yeah. you know, kind of fall short on a few minor details. Mm -hmm. At that level, he does. It's not like he need, does. He need to change many things. It, it's not. It's yeah. just. It's maybe one little thing here, one little thing there that will make the big difference. Um, Eli, I think, needed the change. I think that there was some bad blood at Cowie yeah. and. And I think that a change will be refreshing. Will it be the answer? We don't know that yet. Who, who, who sees? Yeah. Uh, Webb stepping away from Alden. I'm yet to see anybody leave Alden and be successful. That's true, yeah. Nobody has gone, nobody's left Alden and been more successful or as successful mm -hmm. as what they were with Alden. Uh, Every championship I ever fought for was with an Alden <laughs> athlete. Actually, actually, yeah. So anybody that that has a foot in the door and leaves, everyone has their reasons, yeah. and, and 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 that I don't know. But man, I I don't know that it's history says it's not a great mm -hmm. move to leave, right? Yeah. But if you want a longer career, maybe you have to yeah, yeah. acknowledge that it, you can't sustain that ability of the workout. Yeah. Um, and I've never been there, so I don't know what that would is. Would you like to have worked with them? Um, or is it I would like to if, you know, like, uh, like I would, if I was to do a race next year, uh, and this is not happening necessarily, <laughs> but like, like, a, like I would love to race a race at 40, and I would love to go and do a boot camp with Alden okay. to, to race that race. Experience, Just yeah. because like, every, for 20 years, I raced against him. Mm -hmm. I missed out yeah. one year, I, I missed out by one day in 2010 at the end of 2010 uh, I left Kawasaki um, and I called him to see if he would be my trainer okay. because uh, it was when he broke up with uh, Stuart right. and the day before uh, Ryan Villapoto called him and he oh, had committed right. to that so I missed it by one right. day so it's kind of like one of those things like I don't regret not right working with mm -hmm. him but it would be really exciting to work with him for one race and say, and just to just do it because it's not about me, it's not about like that sustainability of week after yeah, week yeah. after week. It's more just going and understanding, you know, and we're and really getting to work with somebody who is considered the greatest in that position in our sport, you know. So and Jeffrey did that in twenty seventeen and then dominated twenty eighteen yeah. using some of those Correct, right? methods, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Final question, Charles, thanks for all this time. Who was the most intense rival for you, Ricky? Because that seemed quite spiky, like oh three, oh four and obviously James for even a longer period who mm -hmm. played on your mind the most or who did you feel the most intense I have to adore almost so dislike they were, it was so different and in they're equally like, like equally I would say both of them okay. like it's hard to say one or the other yeah. one or the other the big difference is is you know James James had not many but he had more weakness than Ricky. Okay. Ricky seemingly, from the outside, 
just never had weakness. <laughs> yeah. Like right when, you know, like a fighter, like when you have him, you feel like you have him on the ropes. Yeah. And like right as you're ready to try to knock the dude the fuck out and put him out or, and like win, he just found a way back, always. Like right when you just be like, okay, you're you're wearing, 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 and you're like, okay, and you're starting to like, you're like, I'm good, I'm good. And then he would just come back stronger and and find something that was another level and you're just like where did that come from you know and so that was that was probably the difference okay james just had james had the ability like his speed was unbelievable and so there was days that you just had to acknowledge that you couldn't go that fast or the unwillingness to die <laughs> to go that fast um, and so some of those days I would just basically, because I was for the most part an easy second, yeah. and when he was that good, sometimes I would pull back. Okay. And so when sometimes he'd pull back, and that was, and then he would make the mistakes. Do you think that was concentration on his? I think part, he's, or? yeah, and that was his weakness. Like sometimes you'd be like throwing down, and you'd be like lap after lap after lap, and I'd be like, I don't know that I can go this fast. And sometimes if you just let him go, and you kind yeah. of almost gave up, yeah. And then two laps later, he would just somehow cartwheel, and then you're like, all right. That's it. And it didn't always happen, but yeah. it, it, there was a chance of that, you know. But then there was, more often than not, he went on and won the race. But he, somehow there was that concentration, weakness, that, that Ricky didn't, didn't have that, you know. And when Ricky crashed, he didn't really get injured either somehow? He just, yeah, like, some ways I feel like Ricky crashed harder and bigger and, and sometimes more, but he always did it at the right time. He would crash on press day, or he would crash on practice, or he'd crash in the heat race. Right. And then always just find a way to be okay in the main event. You know, mm-hmm. on his bad day, he was second or third, rarely third, just mm-hmm. always second, you know. And a, a guy that you're going for the, you know, toe to toe with the championship, that was what, and that's what taught me to be there. You know, like okay. I, I feel like I became consistent and needing to be <clears throat> second, second, mm-hmm. second, thirds, thirds, thirds. You know, like, when you couldn't win you had to be on the podium just because of what I learned from Ricky you know so yeah I would it's hard to say but Ricky Ricky probably gets the the nod of the most intense because of the the ability to just have to find everything you had to beat him you know that's great Chad thanks very much and uh, looking forward to seeing you ride one more time